I'm Claire Bornman. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate from the University of York and uh, where I use design-led or design-based research approaches to investigate the public um, creative reuse of digital archive content, which all sounds very wonderful. I'm not going to talk about any of that this morning. <laughs> Rather, what I'd like to talk about um, is a little bit about my an observation I've made uh, around the application of design in general, really, but it's, it's as applicable to user experience design as well within the UK heritage sector. And then I'm going to go on and I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of constraints in design and a case study around that. But I think it's important before I do that to tell you a little bit more about myself. Uh, I have a professional background in commercial analysis and design completely outside both academia and heritage. So I'd like you to bear that in mind as I go through this talk because I am coming from a very particular point of view. Okay. So I... Oh, yes. <laughs> so I... I need to start with a definition because there's, for me, there's an enduring confusion around what design is and isn't. Um, and it's about design being confused with art. Design is not art. For me, art is really an expression, a creative expression of some internal reality. Design is, is nothing like that. Design is entirely external and it is fundamentally an analytical process um, and specifically a creative problem-solving process. Design starts with the end in mind. Uh, the outcomes that the design must deliver have already been decided and defined in earlier phases. Exactly what Jenny was describing earlier when she said she had to put in place a project management process uh, that asked up from questions, who's it for, what's it for, what's it going to do? Design is messy. It's multiple iterations of information and knowledge acquisition and application. Design is experimental. It's trial and error, it's dead ends, it's backtracking and it's compromise. Design is solving problems as they come up while moving from uncertainty, and I can't say too certainty because there's no such thing in design, <laughs> to less uncertainty. And because of this, I feel that within design or user experience design within the UK, um, there's actually very little design going on. And I say this because if it was being practiced extensively and consistently, I would expect to see greater vari variation in the experiences on offer. But I don't. I can pretty much guarantee what I'm going to get when I get there. And I just put this last slide in there because it's not just digital, it's in person as well. The design educator, Andrea Hernandez, perhaps has a lovely insight into what's going on here from her six-year-old daughter. Her daughter at school represented weekly with a blank piece of paper and coloured crayons. Uh, every week without fail drew a rainbow. And what's happening is a very human instinct to exert structure where there is no structure. For the little girl, she went to the familiar and the comfortable, something that could use all these wonderful colours, the, re the, the rainbows. Um, and I feel that this is perhaps what we're seeing in the user experiences on offer in the UK heritage sector as well. But I'd like to talk now about constraints and how these might provide us with a way of moving away from this, this um, very similar offer and introducing that variety that's missing. In a wonderful piece of, oh, I should just mention that whilst creative problem solving has a really long history in disciplines such as management and organisational studies, up to 100 years, it is, it is almost incredible, but it's only within the last five, maybe ten years, 
that the role of creativity within the design process has actually been studied to any degree academically. Um, and I love this, this uh, research, the bubble wrap test by Meta and um, Sun, which was done in the US in 2015, where they were looking to see the impact of scarcity and abundance on design decisions. So they took a group of student participants, separated them into two groups, and they primed them, they primed their attitudes uh, by having them write either a childhood story of scarcity, of lack, or a childhood story of abundance um, in, in, in any context, any resource context. Then they were all given a piece of bubble wrap and told to come up with some use for it. Their uses, their, their designs were then blind, um, independently blind judged for novelty. Surprise, surprise, the scarcity group scored highest um, for their, their creative reuse of the bubble wrap. And the conclusion that the researchers came to was that, well, what had happened was the abundance group just had no reason to be creative. There was no incentive there for them to, to come up with anything novel. So I suggest that without constraints, there was no creative problem solving going on. Now, constraints and, and creative constraints um, in the world of design come under uh, a, a group of design approaches. Um, the, the image I've got here is it comes under a group of design fiction. I have to say there is absolutely no consensus on this. Uh, you, ask, you can ask 10 designers and they'll come up with 10 different groupings. What there is kind of uh, consensus around is that these approaches, design fiction, design future, speculative design, all come under approaches of critical design. Now critical design is specifically about challenge and it's about disruption. They're narrative based um, approaches rather than sort of the measurement approaches you'd see more engineering type disciplines. They're often around utopian or dystopian futures. Um, they are social in focus, in concern rather than commercial and therefore lend themselves more to prototyping than mass production. And they are very, very good at generating multiple ideas, concepts and solutions. Okay, so I just want to now briefly go through a case study um, that I was involved with very recently in York. And it's about heritage engagement with a place, it's an area in York that has its historically and archaeologically very significant, well over a thousand years of history and very difficult history. It's a site of execution, it's a site of war, it's a site of injustice and persecution. But it's also part of a huge redevelopment project in the city of York. Uh, and this project has been done under the, the, um, the auspices of participatory urban redesign. And as part of that, there are a series of public meetings held with all stakeholders. And one of the questions was, what should we do with heritage in this space? What are the problems? Now, for the local people of York, their answer was very simple. This is a tourist city, but there's nothing for us here. Uh, it's expensive. If I want to find out about one building in this site, I have to pay this group of heritage people. If I want to find out about the other, I have to pay someone else. Um, so in doing that, it was the public and the people who gave us our brief for what Sarah mentioned it earlier, was a, a user experience design workshop held in York at the beginning of um, April. And I was very lucky to be able to take this case study in there and work with a wonderful team of archaeology and heritage um, academic um, experts from around Europe. So the design task facing, facing us was we need to come up with something that's free, low cost heritage engagement, specifically for local residents, which allow them to experience the heritage of the site as a whole, not piecemeal. So the first thing here was to, that's, that's a big brief, so the first thing here is to introduce some constraints, to get some traction in this design process. 
So first of all, a public audience is way too broad to design to. So our target audience were commuters, people walking through this area on a daily basis. Um, so you had a captive audience, but only for maybe five minutes at a time, and they're moving, they're walking. So we have to design a heritage experience for that. And also, it had to be digitally mediated, but those were, that wording was very specifically chosen. It had to be digitally mediated, but it did not have to be a digital experience. And any technology used could only be that that could be carried or worn. After that, we really fell back in the workshop onto some very traditional design techniques, which I'm sure everyone here is familiar with. So we did background research. Uh, we did site visits and maps. We came up, it was only a two-day workshop, so we came up with a couple of personas and a couple of scenarios for those, those people and how they would behave and what they needed from that space. We also concluded by doing storyboarding and wireframe um, drafts. We would have gone further with the prototype if we'd had time. So what came out of that? Lots and lots and lots of things, as expected. By, by introducing those constraints, we had to get creative with the ideas that came out. And we had all sorts. Um, we specifically didn't bother about budgets. We didn't bother about the law. We did what we wanted. Um, <laughs> we did. Um, we, and we came up with lots of ideas, just a few here, to use the historic environment itself as a trigger for the experience. So whether it was visible, like the clock, um, or invisible, for instance, the castle wall is no longer there, the prison walls have gone. And we might be able to use that, that as a person comes within that, that vicinity or takes an action, they would have what we, we came to call a micro experience. Uh, other things were coffee shop based engagements. At one point we had a QR code on a coffee cup. Um, bus stop heritage. We decided we didn't have enough social um, built into our design and the buses were always late. So we put heritage experience in a bus stop. And it kind of went on and on and like this. Uh, one of the key things in this design to make sure it was for local people was to integrate heritage into a city information system. Um, so if people track, were tracking, um, checking the traffic or the weather, they got a bit of heritage too. There is no city information system in York, but we didn't worry about that either. But the important bit in this, in this example is what happens next. Because part of these design uh, approaches, the, the critical design, the speculative design, is actually the return, it's the last part. It's where you take your concepts and your designs and you have to bring them back into the real world and now. Um, this is where you get fit, uh, where you have to make design compromises uh, and hopefully in December we're going to take some of these ideas out onto the street and have the people who gave us the brief in the, the first place use them and tell us what they're like. So I'm just going to <laughs> thank you.